Last year I talked about the trade and cannibalism extravaganza Sunless Sea. I briefly mentioned a sequel in the works, but didn't say a whole lot. Well, right after that video, the company reached out and asked if I'd want to take a look at Sunless Skies, and I said, oh yeah, I'll take a look at it eventually. I think it was on... oh. Well, I guess eventually is now. Don't get me wrong, I liked Sunless Sea a lot despite its flaws, and it did have a lot of flaws. I think what initially drew me into it and allowed me to tolerate a lot of those shortcomings was the setting of it. Who doesn't like an eldritch ocean? So when I found out the sequel was kind of taking place in space, but also the sky, sort of, and you're a train, well, I didn't know what to think of it. I liked trains for a long time. Some of my first memories are watching Thomas the Tank Engine and making those elaborate plastic train track sets. I thought I could be an engineer one day. Then I saw that episode of Henry and the Wall, so I stopped watching that show. Then as an adult, I realized I hated trigonometry and all my classmates exclusively spoke Mandarin, so the engineering thing didn't work either. So in summation, I found the idea of space trains not incredibly appealing. But I kept hearing good things about it and it got a big patch last month, so why not? The good news is that you don't have to have played Sunless Sea to play this game. It'll help you understand some greater context and significance for some things in the game, but it's not necessary at all. You get dropped into the middle of things. It's much like Sunless Sea where you'll likely start off the game confused, but you'll learn more as it goes on. In short, the setting takes place in the high wilderness, a combination of outer space and the sky. It's the early 1900s, so naturally the spaceships are based off of steam locomotives. That's about it when it comes to the game's opening. You get a quote about how awful the region is, and the game begins. There's no character creation right from the get-go this time around, you'll need to complete a short tutorial. If you have played C, the controls and everything will be very familiar. That's a good sign. The first moments of the game show a massive improvement over Sunless Sea. Remember how horrifically slow you were? You move faster now. Remember the confused combat system? Well, that's real time now. You have far more control over your ship. But the real star for me was all the interface improvements. All the dialogue and events are no longer down there, but now front and center. The real time log updates happen right on the map instead of scrunched way down in the corner. No more cramming all those menus, we have a sidebar now. There's more I could go over, but you get the idea. The higher level of design and polish is immediately apparent. The process of character creation is also a huge step up. You have a bunch of backgrounds to choose from and each one has a subcategory. You customize your portrait, rather than pre-selecting one. Your background will also matter more this time around. One of my biggest complaints for Sunless Sea was the grind in the early game. You typically had to do dull sure things because you needed to maintain your fuel and supplies. Well now there are enhanced difficulty options right from the start. You can keep everything else the same, but just lower the rate that's consumed at. Even the unadjusted rate is much more generous than its predecessor. This feels less like a tutorial and more like just styling on Sunless Sea. It's that much better. So my main character ended up being a Zaylor, which was the second best thing I could get to a save import system. Once again you choose your goal. Sunless Skies is an open-ended game. Then it's off to adventure once again. So let's talk about the presentation. Visually, it's gorgeous. All the 2D artwork is hand-drawn and the effort and talent really shows. The game as a whole has a huge variety when it comes to locations, which is also a big plus. There's a nice mix of weather. We can't have a British adventure unless someone dies in a storm. It doesn't take place in one big map, but instead four regions. We'll talk about that in the pacing soon. Still, the game oozes atmosphere with its attention to detail. The menu icons and artwork is also very sharp. Nothing seems like it was an afterthought. I mean, take an icon from Sunless Sea, and then compare it with the equivalent in this game, and there's really no contest. The machinery here runs nicely, but unfortunately the game isn't that well oiled. From time to time the game stutters like a third grader being forced to read aloud. It happened mainly when traveling, and these could last a long time. Several times I thought the game might crash, but it didn't do that during hitching. It crashed in the middle of some stories instead. So this train looks wonderful, but it's running a little unsteady right now. So how about the audio? Well, the sound design is also well done. I honestly found that surprising considering the kind of game this is. After the previous entry, I came into this expecting some really high quality music and some okay sound effects. But no. Once again, a lot of attention to detail was given to the environment. Weather effects in particular stuck out to me. There wasn't just one rain effect, it would change based on the area. Take a listen.
and as expected, the music is still baller. It always carries the sense that the game is an adventure, even in the more somber tracks. It doesn't go into full horror strings or pompous orchestra that often, but it does make them more effective when it happens. Most are on the more ambient background side. So overall it has some really strong presentation, but it does need some performance cleanup. So that's a strong start, but let's talk gameplay. Well as a ship captain, or train captain, you do have a lot of options. Out of all the genres it is, it's a role playing game above anything. On the non-combatant side, you could be an explorer, discovering new lands, helping scientific research, arguing with the dead, that kind of thing. Your ship can be outfitted with specialized equipment for mining operations or for exploring anomalies. This will mostly be done through text adventure. These can be rewarding, but you might also need to risk your crew, life, or money. Your success will be determined by skill checks. You only have four main stats to manage, so as far as a role-playing game goes, it's pretty simple. The better your stat, the better your chances will be in the dice roll. You won't always be restricted to one avenue, since sometimes there will be multiple options. Some skill checks are routine, so if you focus on developing that stat, you can max out to 100% fairly early on. You get new stats by leveling up, and there are a ton of different ways to earn XP. Continuing with the explorer route, your brain gets bigger just by finding new stuff. Unlike a lot of games, you could also earn XP through special trade missions. You know, combat XP is a given, not all games give points for LARPing as U-Haul. When you level up, it's based off a past event. Some are done based off your backstory, some are done based on decisions you made in the game. You're capped at 20 levels, and that's unfortunate. There is another way of getting those up. Hire on officers. These people, animals, and people animals can help boost you up. They also have elaborate personal quests with multiple outcomes that can determine what stats can increase even more for them. Or things get weird. Like, illegal fur affinity page weird. This is all well and good, but still not enough. Let me show you what I mean. When you do whatever you do to get money, you have the option of buying new ship equipment. It doesn't just have a ship slot and money requirement, it also has a skill requirement. These can get incredibly high, to the point where it's like you need to min-max a skill and also have the right officers with the right story decisions to get one of them. So even if you mission for your plus 5 wheels, you might have to wait on a skill. Sunless Sea wasn't like this, in fact some equipment could boost your skills. On top of that, some later challenges also seem to want a really high number in a single stat. So it felt like the game was expecting min-maxing and that's what you should be doing. I can only scratch my head at this. Equipment already costs a lot of money, and it adds weight to your ship, which decreases fuel efficiency. It seems like something that maybe you need a crew requirement for, which is how the engines work that don't have a skill requirement. It's worth noting these engines were actually added in the newest patch and you didn't have a way to increase your speed until now, but this is confusing. The more ship crew you have, the faster your supplies go down. As it stands, you do want a healthy amount of them for events and in case you lose them, but you don't want to go too high up. Larger locomotives will typically also carry more crew. So I'm wondering why I would buy extra crew slots, which also is a skill requirement, when there's no enticing benefit to having a large crew. I mean, there's more people to eat, but we might not have run out of supplies in the first place if we had less people. My point is that nicer equipment and some more interesting events are locked behind having a single stat. Leveling up isn't as fun when you know that mixing and matching will hurt you more in the long run. I'd also think that more people would want to look up the officer path that gives them the number they want instead of what they'd want to happen narratively. If an event pops up and I don't have the number, fine. But when you dock and go to a store and keep being reminded that your number is too low, that messes with you. I know stat requirements for weapons are not uncommon at all in role-playing games, but Sunless Sea didn't have them for a reason. You didn't actually level up, but you did get more stats based off things you did. I'd find leveling up a lot stronger if I was thinking about how it would help me deal with a quest or some sort of event. Not looking for the stat to dump points into so I could finally get a better gun. Do you know how many bees I murdered for space honey? Please, just, just let me buy the gun. So I wish crew was more of a focus for that, instead of skills, but skills wouldn't have to go away entirely. You could do something like 75 veils, or 50 veils and 50 mirrors. Maybe add more options for some later stat challenges. Whatever makes the mid to late game less min-max encouragey. I understand there could be some other reasons for this, but I'll touch on that in a bit. Besides that issue, the mid and the late game are the stronger parts of Sunless Skies. 
They did do a lot to improve the early game compared to Sunless Sea, like the fuel and supply efficiency I mentioned before. You can actually last an absurdly long time without any supplies. If you run out of fuel, well, you'll get a few chances to try and save yourself. The real early game nightmare is figuring out the trade routes, and that's been improved. Maybe. Major ports only buy trade goods, they don't sell them anymore. Instead, you pick up trade missions. You need to bring a set of items to a destination. Each dock has a special export, so you'll always know where to go to pick the item up. Sometimes RNG gods demand a port sells a random item at a discount. This adds some more variety and opportunity. It also means that sometimes you can find the bargain for what someone wants in a port and just sell it back to them for a really good chunk of change. So it's a lot less complicated as far as a trading economy goes. You don't need to do math in your head, fuel and supplies cost the same everywhere. I do wish that wasn't the case just to make some route planning more interesting, but I understand why they did it. For my playstyle, trading was always a necessary evil. This is more in my line of opportunistic merchant way of thinking. Still, I'm not sure how the dedicated mercantile and trade route player base would feel about this. The strength of this series was always the missions and events, but there was always that niche group in a very niche game who actually liked moving rocks between the salt lions. So to all the people who liked figuring out trade routes, your playstyle didn't just die, it was murdered, and I'm glad for it. Trading is more dynamic instead of set shipping lanes. The new real-time combat is very simplistic, but I don't mind it. You just need to fight and dodge and manage your weapon heat down there. When you overheat, you can't strafe or fire weapons for a while, which means you could die and go behind the wall with Henry. So you still need to at least manage your heat levels while you're circle strafing. It's an improvement over what there was before, and you have much more control of your ship's movement and attacks. You can get some challenging and interesting fights, but that's still not the game's main draw. You play this for the moral trolley problems. Train problems. So with all those improvements, here's what I still find issue with in the early game. Oh Jesus. So this time around the early game hell is navigating the first region. It's less like the sky and more like a space cavern. You can spend supplies to send out a scout to mark locations in the map, but it won't tell you what they are or how many continents are between you and it. This can be frustrating, especially when the map has so many dead ends. This wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, but I didn't find myself invested in the story or the setting. I like the dark tone and atmosphere of Sunless Sea. Sunless Skies was promising once again to be a gothic horror roleplay game. I wasn't really getting that feeling. This felt more like a quirky space adventure. It's pleasant scenery, but I'm not sure magic forest is the thing I was looking for. It was around the point where I docked with a giant flower where I started to feel bad. I felt guilty, even. So far on nearly every level, the game was a huge improvement over its predecessor, but I wasn't getting into it as much. This didn't feel like I was playing Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's The Terror, but more like H.P. Lovecraft's Treasure Planet. There was a point where I found more ominous areas of the map, like the huge monster that was frozen in ice that you can mine and other cool stuff, and I did like that. I still wasn't very engaged, though. I did a lot of thinking on this, and I think I've nailed down what exactly wasn't appealing to me. First, after your initial visit to the hub station, there's not a whole lot to do there. It's at the center of the map and should be like your base of operations in the region. You can store stuff there and buy new locomotives and parts there, and that's really about it. You can read about a war going on between a company and rebels. You see the war play out in the game as ships fight, and coming across a battle is not uncommon. Who you deliver port reports to and special trade and event missions can affect the flow of the war in the region. New ships get rolled out, people lose ground and move headquarters. It's really impressive just how much you can do to affect the war and how the world reacts to all of it. The thing is, I only knew the motivations in the vaguest of ways. I ultimately sided with the company because all the rebels were drunk drivers. I was winning the war for London and I really didn't know why. There were times to learn a little bit about it, but not nearly enough. If the new Winchester station had more events and information about the war, I could be more invested in it. I found myself a lot more invested in all the side stories compared to the big sprawling battle going on. My journal was filled with them and I wish I could organize them better. Then some of the random events irritated me. I hadn't cleared the undock and I got lost in the sky. I never had anything like that happen again, but I thought that might be a thing the game did. Still, I realized when I did the Sunless Sea video it had three years of free updates and stories along with an entire expansion pack. So I went okay, I'll at least see what the next region looks like, and then I'll decide if I keep- Alright, yeah, this game gets a, uh, it gets a little different after the first region. It gets a lot better. It's real Halloween hours again. Starting in the forested wilderness does make the transition to steampunk Blade Runner more powerful. It's not just the visual changes I like, but also the stories they're telling and the writing. You get more of a sense of what the rebels were trying to escape from. 
The side stories are better than ever, but now you're getting an even greater look at the big picture. I wish the tutorial took place here for a while before you go into the Reach on an expedition. Now that I have the greater context, I can appreciate this area more. I guess my regret is I should have been trying to get to the second region sooner than later. I just hadn't had a huge push to do it yet. It was also a nice touch to be able to return to the Sunless Sea. The horror and mystique writing here is as good as it ever was, but it gets even better. When you've had enough of black holes and mysterious fog towns, you can move on to the next region, the bickering cult lands of perpetual darkness. You're traveling through the abyss and then cities just emerge from the fog and it's so great. There's a lot more emphasis on light and darkness, whether it's a black hole ripping out your light or keeping it off to not wake the Grunger creatures. This was the kind of thing I was hoping for and they delivered in spades. Getting past the first region is almost like playing a different game. I know this was an early access title and that the Reach was the first area they let out to the public, so maybe that was just the first thing they worked on. Well, whatever the reason, everything after it is pretty incredible. At first I thought I had made a huge mistake doing a video on this in October, but no, that was the right call. There are compelling things to see and read, and there's still a whole nother region after this one. I'll leave that one more of a mystery, but there's a lot of undead there. So, fittingly, the last thing to talk about is the death and lineage system. When you have a character accomplish their goal, the story isn't over yet. They pass down a lot, including their ship, all the items in their bank, their equipment, a bunch of money, all their secrets and items, and affiliations with other characters, and a bunch of things they accomplished. The next character in line has one hell of a head start now. The upgraded officers can be recruited because their story happened. Important construction stay, the state of the war stays, you get new level up options based on what the last captain did. And you have a map and a healthy amount of levels so you don't have to retread a lot, just find new things. You still get things passed down if a captain just dies, it just won't be as glamorous. The Sunless Sea lineage system reset a lot, didn't pass much down, and was frankly baffling. Here it's justified because it plays as an actual continuation of the story. But if you don't like permadeath, it's still an option. It is likely that the level up system is to encourage you to make new characters in the lineage system, but I still think it could use a bit of retooling. The performance issues need ironing out, and the early game needs some help. While a big retooling could happen, I think just adding a few more events for context would help a lot. Tantalize the players a bit more with things to come, so they don't think the whole game will be like the Reach. I know I harped on those things, but overall I liked it a lot more than Sunless Sea. It took a while to get there, but now that I'm here, I'm not coming back down. Between this and Pathlogic 2, it's been really nice to see some sequels that are improving so much from their previous entry. I'm interested to see what they'll add on to this game, or if they make something after it. I might make another video if there's ever an expansion. For now, I could easily recommend this. Especially if you wanted to like Sunless Sea, but just found it too tedious. So you can get it on Steam or through GOG in the pinned comment below. It does feel like a Halloween miracle that I ended up liking the Space Train game over the Scary Ocean game. It's a worthy, and I think better, successor. That's it for now. I've been doing a lot of reading, so I think we'll do a shooty game next time. If you're worthy. I really am still in shock I like train game more, but here we are. Anyways, let's go to the questions. Any chance to review Space Marine? Ideally, I would have done it by now if I hadn't been out for a while. So it'll be sooner than later. What about the Thief games? 1 and 2, sure. Maybe also things in the same spirit like the, uh... The Dark mod? Probably not the reboot, though, because I think... Touching that again might actually kill me. I don't know anymore. Thoughts on game remasters? This is one of those things where I like the idea of it, and there are a lot of good game remasters and remakes out there. Where it gets really awful for me is when it's way too soon, like um, Metro 2033 and the Bioshock one, where it's not really a remaster, it's just some things are a little better and some things are worse, and usually they'll do really horrible lighting for it that messes up the original texture work and other things that were made with the original lighting in mind. So I hate those, but there are some good ones. Butterlord is coming in March, what will happen? Well, it came out before Star Citizen, so that's something. Oh, I'm out of credits. Whatever. I'm kind of amazed I lived to see it because I thought it might just never come out. I probably won't do a video on it when it's in early access still, but we'll see. I liked Warband a lot. I'm just trying not to get too hyped because I don't want to be hurt again. You know how it is. Anyways, I'll see you all soon.